On the 17th of November 1993, General Sani Abacha became Nigeria's seventh military ruler. His rule marked the end of the Third Republic and reverted Nigeria into yet another military government. This government has always expressed its commitment to dialogue as a means of resolving our internal differences. His regime recorded a lot of human rights abuses, several political assassinations, and increased corruption. Many Nigerians consider him to be the country's first real dictator. This project is an attempt to explain the rise and fall of one of the most notorious rulers in Nigerian's history. On August 27, 1985, Major General Ibrahim Babangida becomes head of state. He overthrows Major General Muhammad Buhari in a palace coup. In his inaugural speech, he criticizes Buhari's regime for being too rigid and he profiles a flexible approach. I'm pleased to take this opportunity to declare once again, therefore, that this administration attaches the greatest importance to constructive and helpful criticisms as well as the freedom of the press and to declare further that the administration also attaches the greatest importance of fundamental human rights. He appoints Major General Sani Abacha as Chief of Army Staff as a reward for his crucial support during the coup. The following year, Babangida and his armed force ruling council begin plans for transition to civilian rule, setting October 1990 as the date for this return. He lifts the ban on political activities which had been in place since 1983 and legalizes the formation of two parties, the National Republican Convention NRC, and the Social Democratic Party SDP. He then urged all Nigerians to join either of the parties. In 1987, the National Electoral Commission NEC, is established and taxed with the process of overseeing all electoral proceedings in the country. But failing to meet the stipulated deadline, the date for the return to civilian rule is changed from 1990 to 1993. Babangida then appointed Nes Chonikon, a prominent corporate executive from the Southwest region, as head of Transitional Council and initiates the draft for the constitution of the Third Republic. The gubernatorial and state legislative elections were conducted in 1991, and in 1992, the presidential primaries for the two parties were held, but the results were cancelled for electoral malpractice. Babangida then proceeded to ban all candidates who participated in the election from contesting again. One of them was Shil Musa Yeradua, a former vice president of Nigeria. The next year, fresh primaries were conducted for both parties, and Chief MK Abiola, a prominent multimillionaire from the Southwest, emerged as presidential candidate for the SDP, beating prominent politicians like Babagana Kingibe and Atiku Abubaka in the process. Abiola would later take Babagana Kingibe as his running mate. Bashir Tofa, a businessman from the north, became the presidential candidate for the NRC. Unlike Chief MKO, who was widely known throughout the country, Tofa was relatively unknown except in his home state of Kano. But of the two, he was perceived to have closer ties with Babangida and the military. Abiola's political message was an optimistic future for Nigeria, with slogans such as farewell to poverty and at last a ray of hope. One of his intentions was to manage the country's international debt while presenting himself as someone the international community can trust. On the 12th of June 1993, the NEC led by Professor Onfren Wonsu organized one of the freest and the fairest elections in the country's history. It made use of the system of voting called Option A4, which allowed voters to vote in the open. And even though the turnout was low, no episode of serious violence was recorded. Two days later, the first batch of the election result was announced. Abiola wins 19 of 30 states and the federal capital territory. This included all the states in the southwest, three of the seven states of the southeast, five of the nine northern states including Kano, Tofa's home state, and four out of the seven states in the middle bed. In the end, Abiola won by a 58% majority, 8.3 million to Tofa's 5.9 million, becoming the first Southerner to secure the national mandate freely and fairly. However, this euphoria did not last long. On the 24th of June 1993, General Ibrahim Babangida annulled the election citing the issue of vote buying and national security concerns as reasons. It is true that the presidential election 
was generally seen to be free, fair, and peaceful. However, there was in fact a huge array of electoral malpractices virtually in all the states of the federation. The country is thrown into chaos and widespread protests break out. Over 100 pro Abiola demonstrators will be killed. Abangida's military government then proceeded to terminate all activities of the NEC, shut down media houses, and issued decrees preventing court cases on the annulled elections. Former military rulers Solusha Ambassador and Muhammad Buhari and 10 other former generals issued a joint statement demanding the removal of Babangida from power. And on the 26th of August 1993, bowing to pressures from his inner circle, General Ibrahim Babangida placed the country in the hands of an interim government led by NS Shonikon and resigned from office. And it is with a deep sense of responsibility that once again I accept the challenge to serve as the head of the interim national government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. As interim president, Shoniko wanted to make Abiola his vice, but he refused because he had no belief in Babangida's interim government. The new government had to contend with a failing economy impaired with debt and rising inflation. During Shunikon's brief regime, Nigeria was ranked among the top 20 poorest countries in the world by the World Bank. To revive the economy, Shunikon took the unpopular decision of removing subsidies on petroleum products, raising the price of petrol by 700%. Shunikon also made plans for transition to civilian rule, setting February 1994 as a date for another election. But he will be toppled yet again by another military ruler. This time, his defense minister, General Sani Abacha, having spent only three months in office. Although he was named the head of government, it wasn't clear whether he was in control of the armed forces. In November 1993, the decree establishing the interim government was ruled out because it was believed to have been signed by Babangida after his removal from office, thus making the interim government illegal. Consequently, the following decisions come into immediate effect. The interim national government is hereby dissolved. The national and state assemblies are also dissolved. The state executive councils are dissolved. The brigade commanders are to take over from the governors in their states until administrators are appointed. Where there are no brigade commanders, the commissioners of police in the states are to take over. All local governments stand dissolved. The directors of personnel are to take over the administration of the local governments until administrators are appointed. The National Electoral Commission is hereby dissolved. The new military ruler, General Sani Abacha, was born in Kano, in the northern part of Nigeria, on the 20th of September 1943. He joined the army in 1962 after leaving the government college Kano. Abacha was by no means academically sound, but he was seen by many as a military genius. In 1993, he became the first Nigerian military officer to attain a full general rank without skipping a single rank, becoming second lieutenant in 1963, lieutenant in 1966, captain in 1967, major in 1969, lieutenant colonel in 1972, Corne in 1975, Brigadier General in 1980, Major General in 1984, Lieutenant General in 1987, and General in 1990. He fought during the Nigerian Civil War as a platoon and battalion commander and later became the commander of the 2nd Infantry Division in 1975. He was involved in nearly all military coups in Nigeria, starting from the 1966 counter coup to the palace coup that brought General Babangida into power. But in only a few months, his regime will get a dose of the opposition. On the eve of the first anniversary of the June 12 elections, Chief M.K. Abiola publicly declares himself as president and goes into hiding. He didn't hide for too long. He was hunted by the military government and arrested on charges of treason. It took about 200 police vehicles to bring him to custody. He would spend four years in solitary confinement with the Bible the Quran and 14 guards. During that time, Pope John Paul II, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and other human rights activists from all over the world lobbied the Nigerian government for its release, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. For Abacha's government, the sole condition attached to the release of Chief MKO was that he renounced his mandate 
something he refused to do even when offered compensations and refunds by the government for his expenses during the elections. On the 5th of July 1993, the two most influential petroleum unions in Nigeria, Nupeng and Pegasin, began one of the longest strikes in the country's history. The purpose was to win Abiola's release from prison and force the army to accept the civilian rule. The nation is plunged into a monumental fuel crisis and the Nigerian economy is paralyzed. On July 8, riots broke out in Lagos, Oyo, Undo, Ogun, and Edo State. As many as 20 persons were killed when the state security forces attacked demonstrators. On August 20, the General Secretary of Nupeng, Chief Franco Kori, was arrested, forcing other trade unions and pro-democratic leaders to go on the ground. On the 4th of September, the strike was finally cut off after a lot of pressures from the government. In that same month, Abasha issued a decree that placed his government above the jurisdiction of the court, effectively giving him absolute power. Another decree gave him the right to detain anyone for up to three months. He then embarked on a mission of destroying every entity that opposed his government. For sake of clarity, I've categorized these entities into four. The pro-democratic individuals and organizations, the independent press in Nigeria, the enemies within the military, and the enemies of the South. The major political organization that opposed Abacha's regime was the National Democratic Coalition of Nigeria, NADECO. It was marked out by the regime for total annihilation. One after the other, its leaders and big financiers were either arrested, brutally murdered, or driven into exile. On August 19th, NADECO chairman and other statesman, Chief Hattoni Enaru, former Chief of Defense Staff, General Alani Akirinade, and Chief Colonel Sadebayo were arrested and later released. Alfred Rowan, one of the major financiers of NADECO, whose home was the meeting place of the organization, was murdered at his residence in Lagos. The family of Chief M. K. Abela was not left out as they felt the full might of Abacha's military junta. Abacha embarked on a full-blown financial persecution of the family. First, the 10 million naira owned to the family by three state governments were not paid. Secondly, the UNTA revoked the family's oil license and used some of money owned to Abiola's radio network when not paid. On the 4th of June 1996, Alhaja Kudurat Abiola, a senior wife of Chief MKO and an outspoken member of Nadeko, was murdered in a car by unknown assassins in Lagos. Much of the tortures and killings during Abacha's rule is attributed to his chief security officer, Major Hamza Hal Mustafa. He was often regarded as the angel of death. Abacha had absolute confidence in his abilities and entrusted him with exceptional powers considerably greater than his superiors. At Abacha's request, Al Mustafa assembled a personal security force consisting of 3,000 men trained in Israel and North Korea. These men were largely responsible for the numerous bombings and killings that rocked Abacha's military regime. During Abacha's regime, Nigeria became one of the most repressive African countries for the freedom of the press. The ownership of the free press in Nigeria was identified by state propaganda as essentially southwestern, since most of the media companies were concentrated in the west, particularly in Lagos and Ibadan. Most of these companies pressed for the validation of the June 12 election, which was another way of asking Abacha to resign from office. This situation provided the perfect alibi for General Sani Abasha to declare his hostilities against the press. Journalists who published works opposing his rule were either detained or murdered. One of the papers that was highly critical of Abasha's regime was The Guardian. Its publisher, Alex Ibru, had been a target for elimination. On the 2nd of February 1996, he was shot and wounded in his car by some unidentified men. In March 1995, Former military president General Olusegun Obasanjo was in Denmark for a UN summit when he heard that his second in command, General Sheh Musa Yaradwa, had been detained. He was warned against returning to Nigeria, but he nevertheless returned. Upon arrival, he was arrested by the police and accused of associating with a coup plotted by Brigadier General Lawang Gwadebe. On the 14th of July, a military court sentenced Obasanjo to 25 years in prison. Yardwa and 14 others were also accused of being part of the conspiracy and sentenced to death. Abacha later commuted their sentences to life imprisonment and reduced the passenger's sentence to 15 years. But General Sheh Musa Yardwa would die in prison in 1997. 
Abacha also arrested his vice president, General Oladipo Dia, and sentenced him to death for a coup cool plot in 1997. Here we see him in tears, begging Abacha for his life. Perhaps the most unforgettable story of Abacha's human rights violations comes from southern Nigeria. Ken Sarawiwa, a writer and environmental activist, was a member of the Ogoni people, an ethnic minority in southern Nigeria. His homeland had been the destination of crude oil exploration since the 50s. For decades, Ogoni land had suffered from extreme environmental damages due to indiscriminate deposition of petroleum waste, particularly by the Royal Dutch Shell Oil Corporation. In 1990, Sarawiwa founded the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, Mosop, which advocated for the rights of the Ogoni people. Mosop argued that the operations of the Rio de Shell had devastated the region's environment while bringing no benefit to the indigenous people. In January 1993, Mosop organized a peaceful march to voice their complaints to the government. On the 21st of May 1994, four Ogoni chiefs, all from the conservative faction within Mosop, were brutally murdered, increasing tensions in Ogoni land. Sarawiwa and eight of his compatriots were accused of playing a role in the murder and sentenced to death. On the 10th of November 1995, Ken Sarawiwa, Saturday Dobi, Nodo Hewu, Daniel Boko, Paul Levera, Felix Nuate, Baribo Bera, Berenie Kobe, and John Kwene were executed. Sarawiwa's last words were, Lord, take my soul, but the struggle continues. The executions provoked a storm of international outrage and Nigeria was suspended from the Commonwealth of Nations. The United Nations General Assembly and the European Union condemned the execution and imposed an arms embargo on Nigeria. The United States recalled its ambassador, imposed an arms embargo on Nigeria and slammed travel restrictions on members of the military regime and their families. At least two witnesses who testified against Sarawiwa later recounted. They had been bribed and offered job opportunities with the Royal Dutch Shell for their first testimonies. Apart from the terrible human rights abuses during his regime, Abacha's government was also largely corrupt. In 2004, a list of the top 10 self enriching leaders in the previous two decades was released. Abacha and his family were ranked fourth on the list. They were alleged to have embezzled 1 to 5 billion US dollars. In September 1999, a Swiss lawyer by the name of Enrico Mofreni was assigned to get hold of the money stolen by Abasha. He found out that more than $1.5 billion was stolen by General Abasha and his associates. Between 2005 and 2007, the total sum of $508 million US dollars found in his several family Swiss bank accounts were returned to Nigeria. And by 2018, the amount Switzerland had returned to Nigeria reached more than a billion dollars. In 2014, the total sum of 277 million US dollars earned in Liechtenstein was returned to Nigeria. And in 2020, the sum of 308 million US dollars earned in accounts of the China Islands of Jersey was returned to the country. At the time of this recording, the total sum of 30 million US dollars still rests in bank accounts in the UK yet to be returned to Nigeria, along with 144 million US dollars in France and a further 18 million US dollars in the island of Jersey. Despite his corrupt regime, General Abasha also achieved several economic feats. His administration oversaw an increase in the country's foreign exchange reserves from 494 million US dollars in 1993 to 9.6 billion US dollars in 1997. He also reduced Nigerian external debt from 36 billion US dollars to 27 billion US dollars. Abasha also reduced Nigerian's inflation rate from 54% inherited from Ernest Chonikon to 8.5% between 1993 and 1998. But despite all these laudable strategies, the benefits accruing from his economic policies were not fed by most Nigerians. The Naira became almost worthless, unemployment skyrocketed, and manufacturing industries started to operate at about a third of their capacity. Teachers and students were equally frustrated. For a period spanning March to October 1996, university lecturers in Nigeria embarked on a strike to demand a raise in their salaries. In return, the government banned their association. In October 1995, Abasha set a time frame of three years to hand over power to a civilian government. 
He published a multi-phase political program that included creating more states and local government, conducting local elections on a zero-party basis, lifting a ban on political activities, formation of parties, and conducted the presidential elections, finally resulting in the handover of power to an elected civilian president in 1998. In January 1996, the regime gave the legal backing to the National Electoral Commission of Nigeria, NELCON, to conduct the elections. NELCON organized a zero-party local elections in 1996 and began the process of registering political parties later that year. But with just a few months to the polls, all political parties nominated Abacha as their presidential candidate. However, Abacha would never live to see this plan come to fruition. General Sani Abasha died on the 8th of June 1998 in the presidential villa Abuja at the age of 54. His cause of death remains a mystery because he was buried without an official autopsy. This has fueled many speculations that he might have been poisoned. However, the federal government identified the cause of death as a sudden heart attack. About a month later, Chief M.K. Abiola, the winner of the June 12, 1993 elections, died of a severe long-standing disease of the heart on the 7th of July 1998, the day he was due to be released at age 60. In response to the news of Abiola's death, widespread highway riots broke out in most western cities across Nigeria, particularly in Ogun, Abiola's home state. On the 20th of July 1998, the new head of state, General Abu Salami Abubakar, unveiled his political transition program and declared May 29, 1999 as the handover date to civilian rule. He then proceeded to cancel all elections, dissolve NECON, free all detainees held by Abacha's regime, drop all charges against Azaz, and make a government commitment to respect human rights. On the 29th of May 1999, Chief Olusegun Basanjo, the man who had been imprisoned by Abacha became the first president of the Fourth Republic of Nigeria. Years later, in an interview with the New York Times, General Babangida admitted that he now regards the decision to annul the June 12 elections as an unfortunate one given its consequences. Reflecting on Babangida's decision to annul the June 12 elections, it may be safe to say that we may never have had the likes of General Sani Abasha as head of state and all those who died during Abasha's not so good regime might still be alive today if he never annulled the elections. As for the person of General Sani Abasha, many close to him described him as a firm leader who listened more and spoke less. He often showed little or no public emotions but he was deeply humane. Others concluded that he saw power as an instrument of primitive accumulation and not for the good of the public. In his quest to become authoritative, he became overly authoritarian, culminating in him becoming Nigeria's most infamous leader. If you made it to the end of the video, I want to say thank you. Please don't forget to like and share and subscribe to this channel for more in-depth documentaries like this, it really helps the channel. This is a relatively new channel and we have great plans moving forward. So again, subscribe and hit the bell notifications to never miss our videos when it drops. Until I see you in the next video, goodbye.